Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, especially my Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church family. If you would, please turn in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 130, Psalm 130. And I'm just going to read the whole psalm. It's eight verses, so it's not a very long um, psalm. However, it is very impactful, as you will see this morning. Psalm 130 reads as follows, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I cry for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of sin, of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that they might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Humans, my brothers and sisters, have a natural inclination to count on other people and in things. It's, it's just a fact, of, a fact of life. As babies, we counted on our parents to feed and bathe us, to comfort us when we were sick and to take care of every need that we had. As children, we, we continued to count on our parents, but then we also started to count on others, our teachers and our coaches to teach us things. and our friends to stand with us in in good and bad times. Then as we matured into adults, we have learned to count on our spouses and on our jobs and on others to encourage us as we aspire to reach our goals and to help us to obtain many of the same things we actually needed as children. So we haven't gone far from counting on other people. But along the way, we began to count on things and ideals. We started to count on celebrities to give us role models and counted on sports teams to give us, you know, happy moments and times, you know, throughout our, 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 our weeks. And we counted, we started to count on the likes of strangers via social media, especially in these days. And, then even started to count on self-help gurus. And for some, for, for all of us, honestly, we've also counted on first responders and counted on political figures. And, and, even, and for all of us at some point, even counted on money. But as we've lived, my brothers and sisters, we've learned that nearly everything and everyone that we've counted on, in fact, could not be counted on. So, in the midst of unforeseen circumstances, such as those in which you and I are currently experiencing today, my question to you is, who can you count on in times of uncertainty? This question is, in fact, the, the topic of our, our, this message this morning. Who can you count on in times of of uncertainty. So here in Psalm 130, we can gain understanding and and get an answer for this question. But first, before we get an answer to this question, we have to understand something very central to this this message this morning. My first point that I want to raise is when there's no one else to count on, when there's no one else to count on. 
My brothers and sisters, have you ever faced a situation where there was no one else to count on for help? Just think about, think in your minds for a moment about a, a situation you faced where there was no one else that could help you. Maybe you have faced a situation that was so difficult, so trying, so emotionally draining, so painful that you did not know how you were going to make it through. Some are even experiencing feelings like this right now. There's someone hearing this message right now in the throes of despair dealing with the crisis that is this pandemic, this, this plague, as we've, we've heard it said as well, and really feeling isolated perhaps from the world or feeling isolated because you're not able to do the, the activities and be the social individual that you've, 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 been, you've come, become accustomed to being. Well, the psalmist here in 130 sings out their suffering in such a moment of misery. We can see it here in the very first verse here in Psalm 130 when it says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Mm. I don't know if, we've, if you've ever had a heartfelt conversation with the Lord that came from the depths of despair, but it is certainly something you know that will will move you and re, and help you to realize that you have no one else to count on in that moment but the Lord. For someone viewing this message today. It was the despair of eviction. For someone tuning in today, it was the despair of the repossession. Maybe for someone else watching today, it was the despair of the addiction. It was the despair of the divorce decree. For someone listening in today, it may have been the despair of the layoff. For someone else, the despair of the diagnosis, and even someone else, it was this beloved person's death or that beloved person's death. For someone else, even it was the denial, it was the dream deferred, or even as we mentioned, the loneliness, the despair of loneliness you may be facing in these days and times. But let me help you understand a little bit about this despair. Despair makes us feel isolated and distant from God, but this is precisely when we need God the most. Please don't miss that. Despair makes us isolated and distant from God, but this is precisely when we need God the most. Despair over sin should not lead to self-pity, causing us to think about ourselves more than God. Instead, it should lead to confession and then to God's mercy and his forgiveness and his redemption. When we feel overwhelmed by a problem, my brothers and sisters, feeling sorry for ourselves will only increase feelings of hopelessness. But crying out to God will turn our attention to the only one who can really help. So rather than holding those feelings inside, thinking about the past and thinking about regrets that you may have for things that have happened in your past or things that maybe you hadn't done or things that, that you did and, 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 made, and, and made a mistake on and you, and you know that you had done wrong in the sight of God and perhaps someone else. First, before sitting in despair, you should take it to the one that can and can, can you know, help you heal you of that pain and that sorrow, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, if you cry out like the psalmist does here from the depths of despair, you will, as the psalmist said, O oh Lord, I call for your help. But when you felt that heartache in the past, have you, what have you done about it? Have you called out to your, to your mom or your dad tried to call upon your husband or your wife, perhaps even a best friend, or maybe even sought help from a counselor or even your church family. 
and you still couldn't find relief? You wonder why, why, why couldn't you find that relief? Maybe it was their rejection, their indifference, their inability to understand what you were feeling or experiencing at the time. And it was just impossible for them to be able to help you in the way that you needed to be helped. Sometimes it's because perhaps they were just too busy. And sometimes perhaps they were the, the cause of the crisis. So you clearly couldn't call upon them. Obviously, they, that's a very distressing feeling when you feel like no one in your circle of, of connections can help you in your situation. Well, it's here in this text that the psalmist is speaking to one who is truly able to help and remained ready to give relief, despite the psalmist initially seeking support from others. Because by this point, from the depths of despair, clearly they have tried, the psalmist tried, would have tried everything that they could have done. They would have tried to figure out how to pay the bill. They would have tried to figure out how to fix the relationship. They would have tried to figure out how to get back to work. They would have tried to figure out all these different things and have come up short. And certainly at this moment, they are in a place where there was no one else to count on. So here it goes. I call for your help. This, my brothers and sisters, is an SOS, a 911 emergency call. You hit that button on your cellular phone that said emergency call. And you didn't know what else to do at this point. Well, this is not just some casual conversation that you're looking for on the other side of the, on the telephone, perhaps, you know, as you might with a phone call. This is an emergent need and only one that you know can help you solve the issue is the one that you're calling upon. This is not just asking for something simple. This is not just a, hey, just needed, needed, need a favor kind of situation. This is a plea for help in the greatest sense possible. This is the call of the broken. This is the call of the bewildered. This is the call of the battered. This is the kind of call that says, I have done all that I can do. Or the kind of call that you cry out, they said that there's nothing else that they can do. If you haven't experienced a moment like this, keep living because it seems like we all have at some point in our lives. In fact, it's like the songwriter who wrote the great hymn, I need thee every hour. I need thee, O Lord. Every hour I need thee. Bless me now. O oh, Savior, I come to thee. That's, a, that's a, a situation from someone when they know that there's no one else that they can count on, my brothers and sisters. And today we are trying to understand who can we count on in times of uncertainty. So if you didn't understand that this was that kind of call, then we go into verse 2 and you'll really understand it. It says here in the second the second verse, and again from the New Living Translation of Psalms 130, hear my cry, O Lord, pay attention to my prayer. Again, this is somebody who is making sincere supplication, as you see the word, in fact, supplication in the, in the um, King James Version, someone who is making a sincere petition to the Lord on their behalf. As we know throughout the Psalms, you know, the, the one attribute that the Psalms are generally attributed to, King David, went through a number of trials and tribulations where his life was on the line. Clearly, we're talking about someone who is petitioning from the depths of their soul. In fact, you might have felt like the psalmist now having a heart cry unto the Lord through his pain, her pain. Is something that's familiar to you. Perhaps you had a heart cry unto the Lord through your pain, through your shame, and perhaps through your sorrow. Perhaps now knowing that we too can call on the Lord, that we can call on Jesus for our help, that our calling upon the name of the Lord will no longer be 
for just a casual once in a while buddy conversation. And it will be to petition the Lord from the depths of our hearts, knowing that he is attentive to our prayer. But perhaps you don't know yet that he is attentive to your prayer. Well, we must understand that there are some qualities, some attributes, some characteristics that we must have when we are humbly praying to the Lord, my brothers and sisters. And so I want to share these four qualities of one that's counting on Christ. Four qualities of one that's counting on Christ. Skipping down to the fifth and the sixth verses, and again, reading from the New Living Translation, Psalms 130. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on the Lord. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. I don't know about you, but these encouragingly confident and hope-filled words of the Psalms here in the fifth through the sixth verses made me wonder if this was also the writer of another great psalm of faith, Psalm 121, when verse 1 through two, one and 2 declared, I will lift mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which hath made heaven and earth. Certainly, when you go, go to the Lord, you should be able to go boldly. You should be able to go knowing that he is listening to your prayer. Again, he is always listening, always, always present. Omnipresent is what we call that. But do you know that you can count on our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, in troublesome times, my brothers and sisters? In fact, those who are out there that know, know this because they've experienced his help for themselves. They've seen him help others. They can testify on his goodness, on his enduring mercy, on the faithfulness of God, even when they, you, I, have come short of his goodness. But don't miss in your joy and excitement knowing that the Lord is the one that can help you, that he is the one that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can think or ask. We have to see that the psalmist is also trying to give us insight into some qualities of one that knows how to count on Christ. Let me share these four qualities with you from verses 5 through 6 as we look at these verses more closely. The first one, dependence. Psalm 5, you know, the, 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 the fifth verse says, I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. The psalmist knows that they can depend upon God because they've experienced the faithfulness of God. Perhaps in, in your studies of the word, you too have also experienced through reading these four things. You can experience, the, you, know, through God, you know, depending on God, God's deliverance. After years of slavery, God delivered the children of Israel from, uh, from Egypt. God's protection. God saved Noah's family members from the destruction and preserved humanity through them. That is his protection. And we know that right now we're living in times where God's protection is all upon us. God's fulfillment of prophecy. God fulfilled the dreams that he had given to Joseph and Joseph's future as a leader, as we can see, remember in Genesis. And in fact, both you can see both Noah's family members being saved in Genesis 6 through 9. You can see God's fulfillment of prophecy through Joseph from Genesis 37 and then chapters 39 through 45. And then God's salvation, which we all can experience. And I pray that we all that are that are listening to my voice this morning have experienced it that Jesus fulfilled God's promise of a savior you can see that promise of a savior in Isaiah the book you know the chapter the book of Isaiah in chapter 7 chapter 9 and definitely in chapters 53 which we will talk about again so we can see here that others have depended upon God why can't we depend upon God, my brothers and sisters? If we are truly someone who is counting on Christ, we have to learn to depend upon him. 
Second quality is optimism. Yes, optimism. How do we see optimism here? Well, we see it when it says, I have put my hope in his word. At the, at the end of that fifth verse, I have put my hope in his word. The psalmist could be optimistic because they had learned to trust and have hope in God through his word, which is full of truth. It has empathy for the hurting soul and encourages his people to have, that they may have a better tomorrow. If you don't recall these things and how it, his word has done it, walk with me through this moment when King Solomon's exhortation to trust in the Lord in Proverbs, the third chapter, verses five through six. And then also another familiar passage of scripture in which the expression of optimism the Lord communicates you know, to his people through his plans for his people in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Truly, he is trying to help us to be, remain optimistic. When we count, when we're counting on him, we have to have optimism. But maybe this will also help to trigger you to understand how important the quality of optimism is when counting on Christ. Despite all the calamities faced in the book of Lamentations, we see this declaration of hope in Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 19 through 24. King James Version says, Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath, still, hath them still remembrance and is humbled in me. This I call to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, will I have hope in him. Prayerfully, these words of encouragement remind you of times when you have remained optimistic despite the, 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 the obstacles you may be facing in your life and that you knew on, which, on, on who you could count on. And then lastly, th the third and fourth qualities come together are patience and perseverance. And we see that here in the sixth verse. And I'm going to read it from the King James Version here when I say, my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch the mor for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Now again, knowing that Psalms is a song, we see the repetition in that song. We see that as a declaration, as a further declaration of this person's counting on Christ. In fact, you can say that they really understand this idea because they're relating it to a time, you know, a, a, a time on a tradition of the biblical times in which there were watchmen that would stand at the gates to watch over the, 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 the villages, the communities, the countries, the people, in order to you know, warn them of any impending danger from you know, another conquering or attempting to conquering community. Certainly that person who was watching overnight watched with great trepidation, a little bit of fear, a little bit of anxiousness for the morning, because clearly at night, you can't really see everything that's coming around you. You can't see everything that's happening. Even if you were standing at the gate, if you're sitting at the top of the gate, you couldn't see everything that was going on around you. And certainly some of us have had some of those nighttime moments. We didn't know what the morning was going to, what the night was going to bring. We just simply knew we had to get through it. And as you got through it, you realized how much you were looking forward to the morning, to the other side of, of, of you know, when things were a little bit more clear. Just like they were looking for a little bit more clear clarity in the day where they could see the enemy possibly trying to encamp around them. So certainly, one who has this situation has to have two things, patience and perseverance. Patience is the untiring endurance to an event or situation but in a calm and peaceful manner. Perseverance is the drive to never give up and to keep plugging away at the goal that this person has set. So for example, and we're learning about this in our Bible studies right now, Job 
persevered in his faith in God, no matter how bad his situation had become. So my brothers and sisters, we have to learn to be patient. We have to learn to persevere. And if this is not, if, if this isn't more clear in these days and times that we're experiencing through this pandemic, I can't make it any clearer to you. We have to remain patient and we have to persevere. And that means doing all the things that we have to do to remain healthy and safe, wearing of our masks, doing all the other requirements, washing of our hands. Remain vigilant in this, my brothers and sisters. I know it may be tiresome for some, but you have to remain vigilant because if you believe that the Lord is going to bring you through this and he has given all this wisdom to us and in, in, in imparting it you know, through you know, protecting ourselves until this pandemic has passed, certainly those that count on Christ know that he will be with us. But having now a better understanding of the attitude and attributes of one that counts on the Lord, let's discover why the psalmist said they could count on Christ. So you were looking for an answer to this very question of who can you count on in times of uncertainty? Well, this last point makes it as clear as day. Count on Jesus. Yes, my brothers and sisters, count on Jesus. My brothers and sisters, do you know that you can count on Jesus no matter how big or small the crisis that you are facing? No matter how big or small the crisis you are facing, you can count on Christ, my brothers and sisters. It says it right here in this Psalm 130 in verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8. 3 and 4 said, Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. My brothers and sisters, God does not keep a record of our sins. When he forgives, he forgives completely, tearing down any wall between us and him. Therefore, we fear, as, as the verse said, we, learn, we might learn to fear you. We might learn to revere, that is. That is to respect, to, to, to admire, to, to honor, to, to, to understand God is, is a protector. So that yet we can go to him about anything, my brothers and sisters. That's how we know that he loves us because he forgives us in, our, in, in all that we've done. So when you pray, realize that God is holding nothing against you. His lines of communication are completely open. We have constantly been talking about Second Chronicles seven fourteen because we recognize that that is the answer. If we're looking for an answer, we have to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our sins. We have to seek forgiveness. That is the way that we will get through this because this is more than just a simple viral infection. We realize that this is, has a greater purpose. And my brothers and sisters, we know that in times such as these, we can count on Jesus to be there for us. Perhaps maybe we need a little bit more clarity on knowing that we can count on Jesus. Verses 7 and 8 make it as clear as day. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but it, it, it really encourages me knowing that if we have hope in the Lord, his unfailing love will be his return response. It, it gives me hope knowing that his redemption overflows. It is not just a simple bit of redemption for you and redemption for you, but is an overflowing amount of redemption for this world. That means he can cover the entire world in his redemptive love. But not only that, he himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. What the psalmist is trying to tell you and I today, my brothers and sisters, we can count on Christ no matter how we messed up, if we messed up, we can count on Christ no matter what kind of past we have. We can count on Christ no matter what people are saying about us. Thank you, Lord. 
We serve a mighty, awesome God that can love on us despite us not even loving ourselves. We can count on God's forgiveness. We can count on God's unfailing love. We can count on God's overflowing redemption. But not only can we count on God for these things, but Psalm 30, verse 8, as we've already read, this is Old Testament, y'all. That's what excites me so much about it. This is Old Testament saying that he himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. He himself. Get it. Understand what I'm trying to say. He said he himself. He's not going to just send somebody, but he's going to come himself. And how did our Heavenly Father redeem Israel from every kind of sin? He sent his only son, beloved son, Jesus, who we know is God incarnate. John 3, 16, 17 makes it clear to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we know that he sent himself because he said he was there in the very beginning. He is the word. And the word was, was, was there in the very beginning. And he and his father are one as, as Jesus made very clear throughout his, his journey and his mission and in, in his, in his ministry. But the question you may have is, how did Jesus redeem us? Jesus drank the cup of wrath, consuming God's anger for the sin of mankind. And, I, and as we mentioned earlier, in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5, it, it makes it abundantly clear as to how he did it. It hadn't even happened yet. He hadn't even been born. He said, he would, he said this is what would happen, and this is what happened as we see throughout the, the New Testament scriptures, but here in the Old Testament it said, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did, he was esteemed, did we esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, my brothers and sisters, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and yet by his stripes we are healed. Yes, my brothers and sisters, who can you count on in times of uncertainty? Count on Jesus, the one that took the penalty of, of, of sin for us on Calvary's cross, the one that redeemed us. But not only did he take that to his mortal death, but then he, on, you know, three days later, he got up with all power from the grave, showing that captivity had now been held, been held captive, that Christ had redeemed mankind, that he is now seated on the right hand of the Father, he and the Father once again being one. Making intercession for one, each and every one, knowing that we can count on him in times of trials and tribulations. We can count on him in times of problems and, and pandemics. Eh? We can count on him in times of or hardships and hopelessness. Count on Jesus, my brothers and sisters. Don't lose hope in this time, in this season. Continue to, to remain encouraged knowing that you can call upon the one who can answer your call, the one that can understand your pain, the one that you can have now fellowship in his sufferings, because now we recognize and understand him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There may be somebody out there this morning that has not yet recognized him as Lord and Savior of your life, someone out there that has not yet received Christ. My prayer, my encouragement to you this morning is that Count on Jesus. He isn't going to. He hasn't just done these things. He hasn't just helped these other folks. He can help you. But I pray that maybe there was something in this message that encouraged you to recognize that Christ is is there for you. And if you do now recognize that, please just bow your head to pray with me. God. 
I thank you for allowing me to come before you this day. I know that I've never reached out to you before, but something I read, something I heard, something that, that was said today encouraged me to draw nearer to you, to get to know you. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've lived my life for myself. I've done all the things that I've done, making all the mistakes that I've done for myself. And I come before you acknowledging my faults. I want to get to know you. I want to draw nearer onto you. I want your salvation. I want to, to, to form a relationship with you. Please show me the way, show me how to do this. But I come to you knowing that I have done wrong by you and I ask for your forgiveness today so that I may have this opportunity to, to come to you more often. I believe you hear my prayer. For I, I read that you hear the sinner's prayer. I heard that you hear the sinner's prayer. and I thank you for your redemption. I thank you for giving your life on the cross, on Calvary. And I look forward to getting to know you better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If that is your prayer this morning, I certainly pray that you feel the, the, the impact now that you know who you can count on in these times of uncertainty. And so all my brothers and sisters in Christ who have been counting on, on, on God through times of uncertainty, continue to count on him in times of uncertainty. For he hears our prayers. He knows our pains. He knows our sorrows. And yet he, what he does is he draws even nearer to us. So when you, when you might be feeling far from him, realize that that is because that's, that's the, the weight that you're taking on yourself. And he's saying, let me hold on to this burden for you so that you can draw near on to me. Please continue to pray for our church family and for one another. Pray for this world, pray for our president, pray for our government, pray for, for, for the hurting hearts. There are so many people hurting for various reasons throughout this world today. But whatever you do, pray in an encouraging manner, knowing that God will bring us through my prayer for each and every one of us is that we will remain encouraged during this season because we know that God is always with us and he loves us. God bless you. Take care.